Today, I'm with Daniel Hedger, who's a member of the Strategy Finishing School, and he's going to take us through his strategy portfolio. So, Daniel, I'll hand over to you. So, this is my strategy operating system portfolio. As we know, one of the first things we want to talk about is what we mean when we talk about strategy. So, this is what strategy means to me. I like to approach planning or strategy as being a storyteller for brands. Uh, like a storyteller, strategists identify a compelling problem to be solved. They take you on a journey with a surprising but inevitable conclusion. Above all, the story needs a solid foundation so that complex ideas can be made simple. A strategy has our hero, the consumer, conflict, the consumer problem plus the goal, climax where the problem meets the brand's single-minded proposition, and the resolution, which is the comm solution. Uh, that's you know just uh, uh, one way of looking at it. Obviously, one of the things I like about strategy is that it's a puzzle that doesn't have one answer. So that sort of just appeals to to my sensibilities. Um, in terms of the outputs, you know, in practice, a strategist provides outputs in the form of frameworks and models. So I'll take you through sort of how I interpret these. Um, this is. Obviously, the nested strategy, which is one of Julian's brilliant pieces of, of work. Um, so the strategy on a page shows on one page everything that needs to be done. So it, it identifies a business problem, it identifies a consumer problem, and it works out how to solve one and then solve the other. So, you know, the problem that the business is struggling with, problem is consumer problem has this standing in its way. However, we, found, we find an insight that sheds new light on the problem, so we need to you know, have this communication to help solve the consumer problem so that the consumer problem can be solved, helping to solve the business problem. So I'm going to use an example from some work I've done with a company called the Australian Meat Processor Corporation, which is a research and development body for the, the meat industry. And um, research that they'd done had found that meat works were incurring a lot of money, uh, especially in workers' compensation claims, because of the high incidence of older workers sustaining injuries on the job as they got older. So this isn't cutting yourself necessarily. This is a capacity decline, which often led to chronic injuries. And it showed that people were not talking about when they were feeling this way. And so the, the task was to get me working staff um, at all levels to take the safety more seriously and, and talk about what how they were feeling when they were getting, if they were getting injured. So the strategy on a page for that would be the meat racing industry has high incidence of insurance claims due to older worker injuries on the job. The problem is older workers are afraid to speak up about the injuries. However, the types of injuries that aging workers face can actually be avoided if managed early. So we need to encourage workers to speak up about capacity decline that could turn into chronic injury so that older workers are no longer working dangerous physical jobs and moved on to alternate duties helping to increase safety in the meatworks and keep claims costs down. Uh, so that's how I implemented that for this particular client. The second one is the benefits ladder, which, you know, we use for a brand brief or something, um, you know, helps to establish the different ways that brands can benefit the consumer. Three levels ascending by importance and depth. So brand or product features, functional benefits, and then emotional benefits. Um, and it gets people looking at things from the consumer point of view. And it's especially helpful for brand briefs um, at the very beginning of a process. Um, and I've uh, sort of retrofitted this for Patreon, the um, the, the platform that, that helps uh, creators and their audiences. So Patreon was started by a couple of people who realized there was no simple way for online creators to get paid by their fans. So they created this platform Patreon, um, which I'm sure people know about. For a monthly fee, fans can support their favorite artists and creators often in exchange for additional content and it allows creators to have a recurring income stream and for fans to support artists directly. So for the benefits ladder, I had the product features of Patreon. It's a platform for creators to get paid by their audience on a subscription basis. The functional benefits is it allows creators to fund their own projects that have you know added income on a recurring basis. And the emotional benefit is it gives creators control of their passions and, and be supported by a like-minded community. And I suppose um, the other thing to say is that it's there's probably a 
benefit flat are on the other side of things for the fans because they get to have they get to feel like they're supporting their favorite creators you know just in the same way that that creators feel supported by by their fans now but a tactical brief which is obviously another um, julian's great frameworks there that get her to buy so you know it's it's very good for especially when work i've done as a, as a creative strategist or coming from social media where you you don't get to start at the very beginning you get told something down the line um, we need to extend into this platform or or, or see uh, extend something from a brand platform into a new area and so um, the get who to buy is a great simple way to sort of focus things so get brands have an audience who have a consumer problem to see the brand as the solution to their problem by you know, a specific communication um, and i've got an example of a travel brand that i've worked with uh, who wanted to reach Gen Zs on TikTok and get them to consider booking a holiday using their platform and sort of a little bit of desktop research and then just talking to young people and staff, we found that, you know, Gen Zs are increasingly pragmatic around travel and they don't think of it as something they have to do. It's just a nice to, nice to have. But the thing is, we re usually regret the things we didn't do more than the things we did. So we needed to convince Gen Zs to realize that and take advantage of their youth and freedom, which you're never going to have as much freedom and you're never going to be young again as you are when you're, when you're in your twenties and, um, go traveling now. So we, it, it worked out like this. So get young people on TikTok who are uncertain or worried about the future to consider booking a trip so that by showing that we usually regret the things we didn't do. So the future can wait, take advantage of your youth and travel now. Just this last one out, I've changed this from my original one. But this is the cons framework, uh, you know, it aligns the campaigns, different messages, consumer problems and media placements. It, it maps out what messaging is needed at different points along the journey, as well as where that will live in terms of media. So, you know, the consumer problem in the living, looking, buying phase, the comms task is what we would say to respond to that. And the channel is where we're saying it. And this is another retrofitted one or the Australian liquor store BWS, which stands for Beer, Wine, Spirits. It's a popular chain of liquor stores, sort of bare bones, you know, alcohol shop, but they're having trouble reaching Gen Zs and younger millennials, which is something you hear a lot now. This is retrofitted, I didn't work on this, um, but research was showing that young people are intimidated by going to bottle shops because they feel like there's unwritten rules and things that they're getting judged about by what they're buying and what they should be drinking. And young people don't want to be judged for their drink choices, just like they don't want to be judged for being themselves. So the task is to, to show that BWS is the welcoming, non-judgmental place to buy alcohol. So I've sort of come up with this comms framework where in the living phase, a barrier is, well, bottle shops are all the same. The comms task would be BWS stands out as the refreshing choice because it's actually distinctive. And the channels it would be is TV and BVOD, digital banners, out of home and social. In the looking phase, bottle shops are a bit intimidating. When I'm looking around, they, they seem like it's way too much to handle. The comms task is BWS isn't going to judge you. We'll even recommend strange combos of things to, to sort of you know get your guard down. And then the channel's social ads own social. I come from a social background and I'm, I'm always trying to push, get the, get the brand onto the owns platform as well. Um, digital banners and catalogs because BWS is, uh, if you know Australian, but they're, they're usually next to a Woolworths, which is a large uh, supermarket chain here, and they they benefit from that that placement. In the buying phase, the barrier might be unsure if they have something for me, and the comms task there would be whatever you have, whatever you like, BWS will have it, no matter how quirky you are, and then that would show up in the point of sale in the store, on the own social, and in the catalog. Um, and, and just some examples of how they executed this. I think Sachi's did this in Australia, and I, I quite like this campaign. So they, you know, they use the line, refreshingly, BWS. The TBC actually has a pair of like disembodied boots that's walking around the city and then, you know, um, with, a, with a BWS bag. Um, and then, so you can see sort of these banners and out of home pieces are really saying, you know, it's, it's fine. Whatever you want to drink is fine. So that's me sort of retrofitting what I thought the framework might have been. In terms of the workflow, I've sort of used the sort of from the client brief all the way to the to the post campaign report and shown where I think these um, frameworks sort of come along. I know that 
um, tactical briefs and comms frameworks can kind of go in and out. They've also added a section for the strategy adjustments because you're often going back and checking and, and reshaping things once a creative idea has come on um, because sometimes you can't beat the creative idea and you have to retrofit the strategy um, from the creative idea. And that's my operating system. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. I think there were like a couple of things that really stood out to me is in each one, you kind of had something that up, like grabbed me. So for the first, I really love the strategy as a storyteller and that slide where you talk about all the different pieces we had, like the hero conflict and resolution. We always talk about storytelling and advertising, but this was the first time I had actually seen it really land for me and really that strategy perspective. So that was awesome. I, I really loved that. And then different pieces had different things. The aging workers for the meat processing factory, I feel like you nailed a really specific group there that would have really unlocked the problem and the different pieces from there. The Patreon, very funny. I actually just signed up for my first Patreon yesterday. It's like a my football team's They've got like a data analytics guy who does that. It's really good. And so I'm now on that side. So I know that. And I like the idea of um, the benefit ladder. I thought you could potentially try to push that a little bit higher, the emotional benefit. I was thinking we've got the 24 consumer goal cheat sheet, which is really helpful of like, is it freedom or to follow their passion where they don't have to work the normal job? There's, there was something more I thought you could add to that. Yeah, 100%. The insight we regret the things we didn't do more than the things we did. That was great. Like that hooked me straight away. And sometimes you just get a really nice clean insight line like that. And it's just kind of switches the brain a bit. And I think what I also liked about that, and you actually had it twice here is what I like to see in insights is adding the polarity of two terms that usually don't go together or the polar opposites. So with the aging one you had, get to aging problems early, which are, uh, I kind of clicked and liked. And then with this one, you repeating things you didn't do versus we did do. And that rhythm really helps with writing an insight line. So I really love that. And then finally, the consumer problem with BWS of being judged in stores. I thought you really nailed onto that as well. So it was a really nice consumer problem. But again, great portfolio there of just showing all the pieces through and i always love these because i think if you're going into an interview or anywhere or just your operating system showing someone how you work and the documents they should expect always helps but i'd love to also just pick your brains about your strategy finishing school journey like tell me when did you sign up and what was the kind of moment where you're like all right i'm gonna kind of make the jump um i signed up probably about a month ago and i just sort of barreled through all the modules you know i I was, I'd, I'd been looking at, you know, I'd been signing up for the free seminars. Um, you know, you do a good job of content marketing yourself uh, on LinkedIn and, and the newsletter and everything. And um, yeah, you wore me down. No, it, but it was totally worth it. Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a gut check for me because I'd worked in the strategy department before. I don't know if I so much had the imposter syndrome as I need to show other people that I am not an imposter. So I, I, I liked, you know, every everything you, that you learn in it. I was like, yep, yep, that makes sense, that makes sense. And then I'd learn something new and I'd be like, great, that's that's awesome. Um, and it was making sure that everything sort of fit with what I understood of strategy. And then, you know, obviously learning a lot more about it, you know, so I, I hoped that I would learn the fundamentals but then get confidence in myself that I knew the fundamentals. Sometimes you're not sure if you know something. And, and like you say, there's no like formal training for planners so yeah it's it's like a good place to get that grounding even if you know the, there's a million different ways to do it this is this is a really good start for, for any level really yeah i think that's uh, that's kind of what i talk about and having done the finishing school for a while it's like the most benefit is for people like you who have been in a strategy job for a while this is just like you probably know 80 percent of the stuff this is just the 20 percent like new things and then 80 percent confidence yep doing that i uh, i've got that all right so i'm glad that's um helped like that and now how has it helped you in your kind of like day-to-day -day job right now yeah well actually well this is why it's, it's helped me is that um i was made redundant from an agency job a little while ago um so i'm interviewing currently so it's really actually helped not just the cv but actually putting together my actual portfolio 
and I was and I've used the strategy operating system as as the basis of my current portfolio. And I've obviously used clients I'm allowed to talk about in my real one. So that's a, that's been hugely beneficial. You know, I was in an interview last week and I took them through basically my strategy operating system and they were like, oh wow, that was that was great, you know. So it was that that's actually materially helped me in that sense. <laughs> wow, that that's that's all um that's all that I could ask that you know you can ask for is is doing it and you've invested the time. I think that's the other thing. You've invested the time and learn and, and kind of brought stuff back. And one of yeah, one of the first things is after the fundamentals chapter, I asked people to send in their operating system and you put it in it. I was like, I want to record this video because it's so good. <laughs> Such a great example of it. Any other thing that you would tell someone who's kind of on the fence or been to a couple of webinars? Has it um, I suppose the thing to know is that it's not, uh, it's sort of at your own pace. So I really liked that. And that was one of the deciding factors between, you know, weighing up other courses where you have to be in a certain lecture at a certain time or, you know, um, even if it's online, it's, it's a, it's more of a, a structured thing or more of a formal thing where I really liked that I could sit there for an hour and blast through a bunch, or I could, you know, do a little bit here and there. So, um, it's, it's well laid out so that the modules, they follow on and, but it is at your own pace and yeah, you don't have to do them in the, that exact order as well. You can, once you've done the fundamentals, you can skip around to, you know, the, your favorite pieces. So, you know, I, I think I did it mostly in order, but I'd look ahead to be like, oh, I can't wait to that, that, that segment. And yeah, I think that's really handy. And I, and I actually, this is really strange, but one of the things I really like is that you tick each time you finish the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So you can and see the completion. So you can see, yeah. How much you've done. Yeah. But I'm glad you, it's a little thing, but it works. Yeah, some people don't use that, but I'm like, it helps. It's a mental thing that really helps. Mm, no, it um, is. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing your portfolio with us. I'll put your LinkedIn and everything down below. So yeah, I appreciate that. All right, ciao.